Hello, I'm Dr. Liang Yinfu. I'm one of the neuro-oncologists here at UCLA. I'm also the director of the Neuro-Oncology Clinical Service and the fellowship program director. In this next topic, I will be discussing experimental therapies and agents in clinical trials for glioma. This is an outline to my talk. First, I will discuss about what are experimental therapies. I'll also explain some different types of clinical trials, such as what phases of clinical trials are and timing for these clinical trials. Then most of the talk will be about types of agents that are in clinical trials, as well as examples of current trials at UCLA, mainly for gliomas. So what is an experimental therapy? These are treatments that are in clinical trials that are not FDA approved for a specific disease, such as brain cancer. We also know that their side effects are not well defined, and we also don't know if they are beneficial for a specific disease or not. So the question is, why do we even bother to have clinical trials? We know that we have approved treatments for brain cancer and glioblastoma, such as radiation therapy, temozoloma chemotherapy, bevacizumab, gliadel, and other chemotherapies like carboplan, as well as the Optune array, and do not bring a cure to glioblastoma and other gliomas. So we really do need better treatments to improve patient survival. And without clinical trials, it's hard to know if an experimental therapy would be effective or not. Clinical trials will help us lead to new drug approval by the FDA. It will prove a treatment has no benefits. It can also prove or disprove the safety of treatment combinations and help us identify biomarkers. Without clinical trials, the FDA would not approve a drug to be used for specific diseases. So the treatment needs to be proven that it is beneficial to that disease. It can prolong survival or shrink tumors. The more drug approval we can have, the more options we would have for the treatment of brain cancer. We know that in the last 15 years, we really have had only three approved treatments for glioblastoma. In order to prove that a treatment has benefits, it needs to undergo a clinical trial and sometimes to prove that it's not beneficial. For instance, this is a phase three clinical trial that just published a couple of weeks ago. It's a trial testing immunotherapy for the treatment of glioblastoma. It's a phase three trial of patients receiving the PD-1 inhibitor nivolumab with radiation therapy compared to patients who received the standard therapy of temozolomide with radiotherapy in patients who have newly diagnosed glioblastoma with unmethylated MGMT promoter. The study actually found that using immunotherapy in the newly diagnosed setting for glioblastoma with radiation therapy actually did not do as well as patients who just received standard therapy of radiation and temozolomide. So it tells us that immunotherapy, like PD-1 inhibitors, do not improve survival in patients in the newly diagnosed setting. We also need clinical trials to truly test combinations of treatments to make sure that they remain safe. For example, this study, we tried to combine the treatment of erlotinib and serolimus together. And we actually found that the combination was very difficult for patients to tolerate. Even at treatments also help us identify biomarkers to see if we can predict ahead of time which patient should receive which treatment. For instance, they tested treatment for these patients with radiation therapy versus radiation with chemotherapy. And it was determined that in patients with co-deletion of 1P19Q on their tumors, those patients did much better if they received chemotherapy in addition to radiation therapy compared to radiation 
therapy alone, where the survival pretty much double in years. Study showed that having 1P19Q co-deletion is a predictive biomarker for the treatment with chemotherapy. Next, I'll explain a little bit about the trial, uh, the process to get a drug to FDA approval. So for a drug to get to the FDA, actually it needs to go through many years of testing. First, it has to go through a preclinical testing phase where the drug is actually studied in the laboratory setting and perhaps with animal models before it can go into trials in human patients. Then in trials, it needs to go through multiple phases of clinical trial before it can be reviewed by the FDA, usually at least three phases of trials. And there may be a phase four trial if the drug is looking for a different indication. In a phase one study, this is when we're looking for an actual dose for the drug. We're looking for something called a maximum tolerated dose. That is the dose where most patients would tolerate the drug. Realize this is about tolerance, not effectiveness. So we're actually not testing to see if that dose is effective, or maybe we don't even need that dose for the drug to be effective. We're really just looking to see what's the most likely dose that would be tolerated by most patients. And it really defined the toxicities of a drug so we know what the side effects might be when a patient takes it. And maybe we can see some benefits at a phase one level. And there's usually no control group. This is an example of a phase one study to look at how a drug is metabolized in a patient. So um, not only do we look at maximum tolerated dose, but we can also look at metabolism of the drug and learn more about when a patient should take a drug, for instance. So in this case, the, a drug R115777 was tested in two different group of patients. One group got seizure medications that are enzyme inducing. That is, these are seizure medications that are metabolized in the liver, and that's the enzyme inducing anti-epileptic drug group, group B. And the other group of patients would um, get non-enzyme-inducing anti-epileptic drug. And we can see that when the drug was given with enzyme-inducing medications, the level of the drug in the body drops significantly. So it shows that this drug really should not be given with enzyme-inducing medication, otherwise it won't work as well. Phase two is when we get the first look at the benefits of a medication to see if it's effective against the tumor at that maximum tolerated dose. It also can further define side effects because more people will be enrolled into this phase. And it can be used to compare benefits to a historical control, but usually doesn't have a large control arm. It's usually not enough to prove that a therapy is working or not. That's when uh, a drug needs to go through a phase three trial. This is something we call a gold standard trial where the experimental therapy is compared against another set of well-known treatments to prove that it may be better than the standard treatment. There's usually is two arms, but nowadays we can do more than two arms in a phase three trial. In cancer trials, there would not be any arm where there would be no treatment. So it's usually an experimental agent added to another therapy versus chemotherapy plus radiation, for instance. Again, in cancer patients, we would not have a purely placebo-controlled um, arm. So one arm, even if it is placebo against the experimental agent, they would still have some sort of other treatment with that placebo. Usually this is when we define endpoints for the trial, such as is the drug improving survival or can it shrink tumor or can it improve quality of life? And we can look at that for the experimental agent versus the standard therapy. We also test glioma at different timing. 
there is a setting where a treatment may be tested in the newly diagnosed setting or upfront setting. That is when a patient was first diagnosed with a tumor, uh, with a cancer, and is supposed to undergo surgery. And if it's a glioblastoma, then we would usually treat with radiation plus or minus temozolomide chemotherapy followed by adjuvant temozolomide chemotherapy. So if we are to test a, an experimental agent with this, with, at this time, it's possible that perhaps we replace temozolomide uh, with that experimental agent or add it on to radiation and temozolomide plus an experimental agent. But as you can imagine, that time, since we do have a standard therapy, it's hard to test a, and do a quick trial to know whether an agent would work or not. So most clinical trials for gliomas actually occur in the recurrent setting so that a trial can go through faster, so we can quickly look to see if a drug is effective or not. If a drug is proved effective, that would be looking to use it as a second or a third line treatment after standard therapy. So a recurrent time is when patients have already undergo, undergone standard therapy with surgery, radiation, plus or minus temozolomide chemotherapy, then the tumor grows, that would be considered a first recurrence. If they went on another treatment regimen and the tumor grows again, that would be considered a second recurrence. So most studies for gliomas at recurrence are geared toward looking for second or third line therapy. I also want to introduce a different type of trial that is not really part of the phase one, two, three paradigm of trials, and that's something called a window of opportunity trial. These trials often can occur long after a phase two or even a phase three of a drug where the drug may be adapted to be used from other cancer setting, for instance, there was a if if the drug was already approved for lung cancer, and now we would like to know if it would be helpful for brain cancer. The thing with it, the window of opportunity trial is that it helps us understand better if the drug can get into the brain, can affect actually brain cancer versus other cancers, and it helps us understand the pharmaco pharmacodynamic effects of the drug. That is, is the drug changing the environment of the cancer cells. And usually how we do that is we would test a drug before a patient would get a surgical resection of the tumor. That way the tumor tissue can be removed to look for that pharmacodynamic effect of the drug on the tumor. And then usually afterwards the patient can continue on with the drug. And this is really a much faster way than waiting to see if a drug is improving survival or not for our patient. This way we can study quickly if the drug is actually changing the tumor in itself, um, the way we should see it change. And that helps us understand, yes, the drug is helpful, and now we can bring it to a much bigger and longer trial. Next, I will go over the different types of experimental agents that we normally see in clinical trials for gliomas. So usually we can categorize these type of experimental agents in different ways. Uh, one easiest way to think about it is are these classes. We could have DNA damaging agents like radiation or chemotherapy. Um, there are a lot of clinical trials that really test drug delivery systems. A lot of clinical trials for gliomas use molecular targeted therapies. Of course, right now, uh, one of the hot area in cancer research is immunotherapies as well as gene or viral therapies. Or a drug could be a combination of these, or we could combine many, many different modalities together in a clinical trial. Radiation and chemotherapies damage the DNA and therefore would focus on damaging more cancer cells since they are making a lot of DNA in order to grow versus normal cells usually are not dividing and making more DNA. Since we already have relatively well-studied radiation, 
for radiation clinical trials is usually to improve radiation or uh, such as changing the dose or delivery type. And the same thing with chemotherapy, maybe changing different dosages of chemotherapy or trying different types of chemotherapies. However, we know for brain cancer specifically, chemotherapies can be limiting. So most clinical trials uh, don't focus as much on these rather than trying to enhance radiation effect by adding a sensitizer. For instance, temozolomide itself helps improve the effectiveness of radiations against cancer cells, so it sensitizes radiation. We can also look at different agents to perhaps protect normal cells from the damaging effect of radiation. Uh, there are not too many clinical trials in these type of agents right now, but some that have been studied in the past maybe are growth factors or even bevacizumab or avastin can be a protective agent as well as use of a medication called memantine to help with memory for patients who had whole brain radiation therapy. We are testing a clinical trial at UCLA uh, to see if we can reduce the resistance of cancer cells to radiation therapy. This is actually part of our SPORE Project 3, where we looked at um, adding a group of agents called dopamine receptor to see if the addition of dopamine receptor to radiation therapy can kill more cancer cells than just radiation alone. And the project actually found that add a third agent that is a cholesterol blocking drug to the dopamine receptor inhibitor as well as radiation therapy. And mice uh, with brain cancer actually survive even much better. So we are developing a clinical trial right now that is part of the window opportunity trial that I discussed earlier, where we will be treating patients with in the recurrent setting with radiation therapy with the dopamine receptor inhibitor quetiapine and also a cholesterol blocking agent called simvastatin in different arms. And then those patients would then undergo a surgical resection of their tumor in order to remove tissue. And this way we can quickly see if we add these agents together, will it affect the tumor cells the way we expect it to, um, so that we can run the trial faster and learn very early whether this combination of treatments would be effective or not. Since it's a window of opportunity trial, we will only be enrolling patients who are needing a tumor resection and radiation therapy. Another set of possible experimental approach in neuro-oncology could be looking at drug delivery system, uh, such as using different type of devices perhaps to see if drugs can get into the brain better. And actually some treatments like targeted agents or even viral therapies uh, are can really considered drug delivery vehicles since they're made to bring the actual treatment to the cancer cell itself. A lot of these type of drug delivery systems try and limit systemic exposure to the experimental agent so that there's less toxicity and side effects on the patient. Most of our clinical trials at UCLA really focus on these type of agents, which are molecular targeted agents. These are agents that block cellular pathway. We're trying to block how cancer cells can grow, for instance, or how they can um, cycle so that they can live longer. We block the signal transduction within a cancer cell, block how cells can make blood vessels or obtain nutrition or metabolism in order for the cell to continue growing or different regulation pathways, or even how the cancer cells can metastasize, or how the immune system can be affected by the cancer cells. So these are different cellular pathways that can be blocked by a molecular targeted therapy. So how is a molecular targeted therapy different than the traditional radiation and chemotherapy? So like I mentioned earlier, radiation and chemotherapy are DNA damaging agents. They 
work by blocking new DNA being made versus molecular targeted agents are actually blocking the protein level, which are really the effector of cellular functions is proteins that make things work in a cell. It can be more specific to cancer cells rather than uh, normal body cells. Most molecular targeted agents are used in different, kind of have different classifications. They may be pathway inhibitors, which are pathway that leads to cellular function. They may be blocking metabolism of a cancer cell. They could enhance cell death by trying to get the cell to actually undergo lysis, since cancer cells like to stay around and uh, do not undergo destruction. Or we can use targeted agents to actually affect the tumor microenvironment, affect how the immune system interact with cancer cells and kill cancer cells, or how the um, targeted agent can block blood vessels from growing so that blood vessels cannot be made to feed the cancer. So I'll highlight some molecular targeted therapies and uh, really tumor microenvironment immunotherapies that are being done at UCLA so that you have a better understanding what these may be. This is one of the molecular targeted therapy that we build, will be in clinical trial at UCLA. This drug, ICAPA mesbib or PUAD, is actually an inhibitor of something called HSP90 that is within epi chaperones. HSP90 is a series of proteins that cells would activate when they are under stress. And usually what happens with normal cells is that when they are under stress like this, it would lead to degradation of the cell when they have these increased proteins. However, cancer cells actually take those stress proteins or chaperones and make them into multiple cluster of epi chaperones. So it's usually just seen more in cancer cells and not in normal cells. So this drug specifically can cross the blood brain barrier and it would only block HSP90 that are within these cancer cell uh, associated epi chaperones. And when it inhibits that protein and the epi chaperone, it would cause those epi chaperones to collapse and causes the cancer cell to degenerate and lead to cell death of the cancer cell while um, normal cells can then recover. So currently is in phase one clinical trials for glioblastoma with IDH wild type that is in the recurrent setting as well as uh, grade three or four IDH mutant astrocytoma. Other than the more uh, broad blocking, molecular targeted blocking agents like the uh, ICAPA mesbit, for instance, we also have agents that block a lot more specific proteins that are on the cellular pathway. So in glioblastoma, for instance, we know that most of glioblastoma can have very specific aberrations in the genetic of the tumor. And these aberrations can maybe be drivers that are leading, causing the cancer cells to grow. These are kind of the main three driving mutations that we often see in glioblastoma, these three classes of mutations. And if we, and usually a cancer cell would have one or two type of aberration, but not another. So we could try and focus on targeting these specific cellular pathway aberrations in order to stop the cancer cells from continuing to live and divide and grow. The problem though is that not all tumors, like I said, have all three pathway aberrations. One tumor may have one or two aberration and then would be completely different from another uh, glioblastoma tumor. So if we try and just pick one targeted agent, it would not work for all patients with glioblastoma because again, one patient 
may have a tumor with one aberration but that's not the same as an aberration that is seen in another patient. So the idea is that we need to stratify patients based on their actual molecular abnormality of their tumor in order to pick the right drug for the right patient. In another work, the, a blue drug should just go to the blue patients and a pink drug to the p pink patients. That way we will really know whether a drug works or not. So our goal with these molecular targeted agents really is to see how best can we individualize therapy. So therefore, there are a couple of agents that are in clinical trials that would be very specific for patients who have tumors with very specific mutations. One drug, for example, is ARS-801, and this is actually developed from what our SPORE Project 2. Uh, if you remember when I showed you the process of how to get a drug into a clinical trial, it could take many, many years in order for a drug to go into a clinical trial. However, with this project, our Project 2 team was able to develop this new drug and it is now in phase one clinical trials in human patients with glioblastoma. This drug is designed specifically to block EGFR, which is a very well-known pathway that can be activated in a lot of patients with glioblastoma. It is designed to be highly brain penetrant, designed to really go straight to the brain. It is currently in phase one clinical trial for patients with recurrent glioblastoma. And in order for the drug to work, we need the patient have tumors that have abnormality in EGFR, so something called EGFR amplification, and also with wild type P53. So we would need tissue and prove that that tumor tissue has this molecular abnormality before patients can enroll into this clinical trial. We also try and use different agents based on the molecular subclass of the brain tumor. For instance, you have seen this slide from other talks today, and uh, we know that gliomas are generally divided into IDH mutated and non-IDH mutated or IDH wild type of gliomas. And under those gliomas that do not have IDH mutation, there can be different other types of mutations that we often see. Like I mentioned, EGFR is a large group of patients, but there are actually a lot of other different molecular classification to these tumors. So a lot of time we may only use specific agents for a specific molecular subtype. So this, these are kind of examples of molecular targeted therapy that we have at UCLA for different subtype of tumors based on their molecular status. We have several for patients with IDH mutant glioma, uh, also several agents for patients with mutation in H3K27M. We also have clinical trials for other types of tumor also, although I won't talk about these, I'm just listing them as examples. So you may uh, have seen this talk about molecular classification of tumors based on IDH. So IDH is a uh, protein that can be seen in a class of gliomas. And we think that this protein is actually in the precursor cell. It's kind of the beginning mutation seen in a cell that is about to become a brain cancer cell. And in, in animal models, they have found that if they block this mutation with inhibitors of IDH1, it would slow down the growth of the tumor significantly. For patients with IDH mutant tumors, uh, there is a drug called voracidinib that has very good brain penetrance that can inhibit both IDH1 and IDH2. And uh, currently, the phase three trial for this drug is actually close to enrollment. We've already finished completed enrollment into that trial, but there is going to be another different clinical trial for patients that may be undergoing surgery for their recurrent IDH mutant glioma. And we there in that trial, patients would have the addition of immunotherapy to the drug voracidinib. And I also mentioned earlier that this drug, the HSP90 inhibitor, ICAPA mesbiv, is um, also available for patients with IDH mutant tumors. Another 
molecular subtype of glioma is the glioblastoma with H3K27M mutation. And for this group of patients, we do have a phase three clinical trial using the drug on 201 to be given with radiation therapy. Uh, this drug has been in clinical trial for recurrent glioblastoma with H3K27M mutation, and it has been found that there were patients actually who had tumor shrinkage when they go on this drug. So now it's being tested with radiation therapy. It's a drug that blocked both the DRD2 receptor as well as um, a protein called CLPP. The dual function of this drug seems to be able to lead to increased cell death and decreased cell survival of cancer cells. Other than molecular targeted therapy, like I mentioned, we also have different other ways to approach of killing cancer cells in neuro-oncology. So the next class is the gene or viral therapy. So gene and viral therapies are, have actually been around for many decades. And we have found that it can be very safe to use gene therapy in blocking brain cancer cells. And usually in order to introduce a gene that can lead to cancer cell death, we would need to use viruses to introduce that gene. So there are different ways of um, a virus can introduce a gene into a cancer cell or kill cancer cells directly. There are oncolytic virus, and they are actually designed to just kill the cancer cells directly. Uh, and they are usually engineered in a way that they would only recognize cancer cells and directly kill the cancer cells as the virus in itself. Versus viruses that introduce genes into the cancer cells, they are actually gene therapy viruses. And what they do is they may introduce a gene into the cancer cell genetic makeup that may be making make a chemotherapy or make some sort of toxic agent that would then kill the cancer cells. So this is actually a virus that uses gene therapy to kill cancer cells. Either way, viruses can also trigger immune response in the brain, and that also improves the function of immunotherapy to fight cancers um, at their location. Immunotherapies have been a more recent type of cancer treating agents. However, many immunotherapies are now actually approved for various cancers, but none has been approved for brain cancer in the United States. The goal of immunotherapies really are to induce the, a patient's own immune system to fight cancer cells and use all the arsenal of the immune system so that the cancer cells can be blocked and killed. Um, there are various types of immunotherapy. There are vaccines, checkpoint blockades, adopted cell therapy, engineered antibodies, as well as viral therapies, like I mentioned earlier, can themselves also trigger an immune response against a cancer cell. So this is kind of a schematic of what our immune system does, and that may help understand why we have different types of immunotherapy. So usually what happens with a tumor is that when um, a tumor develops inside someone's body, they can actually release something called cancer cell antigens. And usually things like chemotherapy or radiation therapy or targeted therapy actually increases the release of those antigens. And our body needs to see those antigens in order to develop an immune response against it. So when those antigens are released, they are seen by cancer antigen presenting cells. And those cells then would uh, go to our body's lymph nodes where they actually become, they activate different cells that then uh, develop into killer T cells. And those killer T cells would then travel back to the site of the tumor. They have to get through blood vessels in order to get to 
the tumors themselves and then directly kill the cancer cells. There are also engineer T cells that can recognize the cancer cell and kill it directly and does not really have to go through this process of antigen presentation. Things like vaccines work at this stage at step two, where it's trying to get the body immune cells to recognize that the antigen is foreign and it needs to develop some sort of system to kill anything with these antigens. Other treatments like PDE1 inhibitors, for instance, or cell um, immune checkpoint blockades help at this level here because what happens is when a T cell is trying to kill the cancer cell, the cancer cell actually can try and stop the T cell from working very well using checkpoint blockades. So drugs that that releases that break or fight against that blockade would work to allow the T cells to work harder at killing the cancer cells. This is kind of uh, my simplistic view of what I just showed you earlier. Like I mentioned, a tumor must have antigens, and those antigens lead to a body immune response using various cells to then activate a T cell. And then the activated T cells must get through the checkpoints, get through the blood vessels, uh, not be stopped by regulatory T cells in order to find the cancer cells and destroy it. So this is again, uh, explaining the different types of immunotherapy that have been developed. So things like adopted cell therapies are really engineered T cells to attack the cancer cells directly. Antibodies are proteins that can block certain antigens, like those markers, like I said, on cancer cells. And they can be engineered to recognize specific antigen in order to know that's a cancer cell. Viruses, like I mentioned, from infecting cancer cells in itself would just um, activate an immune response to kill the cancer cells while it's trying to kill the virus. Checkpoint inhibitors are drugs that try and stop the breaks that cancer cells are putting on the immune system. And the vaccine therapies are trying to introduce cancer cells antigens as foreign so that our immune system knows to fight those cancer cells. So one type of immunotherapy that's going into clinical trial here at UCLA soon is something called the EGFRV3 T-cell by specific antibodies. So what These T-cells by specific antibodies are, they're actually engineered antibodies or engineered proteins where they can actually bind both to a T-cell with CD3 and special antigen on a cancer cell. In this case, the special antigen is this abnormal mutation that I've probably seen about a quarter of all glioblastoma, something called EGFRV3. So the antibody would then bind both to a T cell and a cancer tumor cell with EGFRV3. And that way it acts like a bridge where the T cells can directly then kill the cancer cells since it's right right near each other. So therefore, in order uh, to be enrolled into this clinical trial, patients must have this EGFRV3 mutations on their tumor because this antibody is direct, is specifically made only to see tumor cells with EGFRV3 mutations. It currently is in phase one clinical trial. Another type of immunotherapy that has a lot of different functions is a targeted agent as well as a viral gene therapy as well as an immunotherapy. What it is is actually a virus that introduces a gene into cells that make blood vessels for tumors. So really what it does is try and stop blood vessels from being made for tumors. But since it's also a virus, it can also trigger the immune system around those abnormal tumor cells with the abnormal blood vessels. So therefore it both starve the tumor and not allow it to make blood vessels, 
at the same time as recruiting immune cells to enter the area where the tumor is and in both ways try and kill the cancer cells. It is also a window of opportunity trial. Again, try and remove the tumor tissue after a patient has been giving this treatment by IV in order to see, are we seeing these processes happening at the site of the tumor to make sure that the drug is doing what it's supposed to be doing. We also have vaccine therapy directly directed against glioblastoma. And again, what vaccines do is they actually are trying to stimulate the immune system against the cancer specific antigens so that our own immune system will go and seek out those cancer cells with those antigens and kill it directly. Uh, there are various vaccines that are, have been in clinical trials. Here at UCLA, we use a DC Vax, which is an autologous antigen on individual tumor. And I'll explain it a little bit more later. There are also other vaccines that are made for specific antigen, for instance, vaccines that just target HRVV3 or vac peptide vaccines that block the H3K27M mutation, for instance. So at UCLA, we have the DC Vax, which is an autologous vaccine. What autologous means is that the vaccine is made only for that patient's individual tumor. What happens is at the time of surgery, a tumor is removed and the antigens from that tumor is actually separated and mixed together with the patient's white cells. So the immune cells learn that those antigens are abnormal so that we now have a vaccines where we have activated dendritic cells that recognize that that patient-specific tumor is an abnormal tumor in cancer, and the vaccine is injected back to the patient with the hope that it will then, um, those cells are, will activate T cells and travel to the site of the tumor and kill the tumor, any leftover tumor after surgery. So again, in order to develop that autologous vaccine, patients must have tumor removed. The tumors have to be a certain size in order to get enough clinical enough cells to make a vaccine. And then after surgery, the patients would then get the vaccines um, three times. Checkpoint inhibitors are actually a break on the immune system because the T cells, which are the cells, the soldiers that go and kill cancer cells, sometimes the cancer cells actually can inactivate those T cells on their own. They have special receptors called PDL1 that would bind to the soldier's T cells and tell the T cells stop working. So these checkpoint inhibitors actually stop that process that is release this break on the T cells so that the T cells can keep working longer in order to kill more and more cancer cells. And they're called checkpoint inhibitors for that reason. There are various checkpoint inhibitors that are FDA approved for other cancers, but again, none is approved for brain cancer. I mentioned that recently there was a clinical trial in the newly diagnosed setting where the checkpoint inhibitor did not seem to work when it's added to radiation therapy. However, we find that the checkpoint inhibitors may work better when it's re, um, given in the recurrent setting, especially in patients before a surgery. In this clinical trial, we found that when the checkpoint inhibitor is given before a surgery, patients survive a lot longer than if the checkpoint inhibitor was only given after the surgery. And this is related to the fact that the surgery in itself help chain specific cells in the tumor microenvironment that allow the checkpoint inhibitors to work better. And this kind of come to the idea that our clinical trials at UCLA are just not checkpoint inhibitors anymore or just vaccine trials. The idea is we need to activate the immune system in different ways for it to work better against cancer. And of the ideal way for the immune system to work against a cancer is that the tumor itself must put out a lot of antigens so that the body knows and sees the antigen in order to develop an immune response. And of course, 
the patient also must have a good immune system in order for the different immune cells to activate that T cells. That activated T cells must get to the tumor cells somehow, pass those blood vessels, pass those checkpoints, and then reach the tumor cells to kill the cancer cells. The problem with brain cancer like glioblastoma is that to start, usually, especially at the newly diagnosed setting, the tumors tend to have very low antigen. So it's really hard to trigger the immune system for anything else downstream to work. Obviously, patients undergo chemotherapy and they can have poor immune system. And then unlike other cancer in the body, it is harder for the immune system to get to the brain in order to kill brain cancer cells. So the best way to effectively create immunotherapy against brain cancer would be if we use combination therapy. We may want to find ways to increase tumor antigens, and we know that tumors at recurrence, especially with IDH mutation or methylated MGMT, tend to develop more antigen when it grows back after radiation and chemotherapy, so not in the newly diagnosed setting. Uh, tumors with something called DNA repair mutations may put out more antigens. Different treatments can lead to increased immune response like vaccines, for instance, or work at activating T cells, work at at blocking the tumor microenvironment that may not allow immune cells to work very well. We actually have different ways of blocking, like the adenovirus I discussed earlier, um, that also improve the immune system, but also actually block blood vessels from growing in tumors. The vaccine trial, uh, the DC vax, that improve the immune system. The T cell by specific antibody against EGFRV3, which actually try and directly activate T cells, checkpoint inhibitors that try and work against the tumor microenvironment that's blocking the immune system from working. But really, it requires us to really combine all of those modalities for the immune immunotherapies to work better. Like I mentioned, the DC Vax trial uh, not only uses the autologous DC vaccine, but it's actually also adding a checkpoint inhibitor on top of the vaccine, as well as the resection of the tumor in order to improve the function of any single agent alone. So it's actually a combination treatment. And that's part of our SPORE Project 1, and the trial is ongoing, and we've actually enrolled probably about half of the expected enrollment at this point. We also, the VB111 viral gene therapy cell uh, trial is now coupled with a tumor resection to see if the tumor resection may make the immune function of the virus gene therapy work better. So on top of immunotherapies, we also have other treatments that we have combined. Like I mentioned very uh, much early about combining a, a receptor and a DRD2 and receptor inhibitor together with radiation as well as a cholesterol blocking drug. Now that you know some examples of clinical trial therapies, I'd like to discuss how we can make those clinical trials better and why the trials at UCLA are considered smart trials. So for us, we can try and improve clinical trials by leading adaptive trials to make trials faster, and so we can discover different treatments faster, focus on individualized therapies, design trials with molecular correlations, and collaborate with other research scientists and center of excellence in brain cancer treatment throughout the country. So an adaptive trial is different from historical usual trial. Usually historically, a trial which has had one drug or one drug combination may be against a control. However, in an adaptive trial design, we would uh, be able to test multiple drugs at once and then adapt quickly to drugs that work better and focus more on those drugs instead of drugs that are not working. So this adaptive trial is part of 
the design with the group GBM Agile, which is a group running clinical trial internationally for patients with glioblastoma. In this trial, patients can be enrolled when they have a newly diagnosed glioblastoma as well as at the recurrent glioblastoma setting. Patients would be randomized to many different clinical therapies. In the newly diagnosed, they still get radiation and temozolomide chemotherapy to start, but then they would be randomized to different experimental therapy, either with radiation or after radiation has been completed. Currently, there are five different drugs that are available in the trial. The goal of the trial is to quickly adapt to the ones that work better and then rapidly move the ones that are working well to phase three in order to... Other than these adapted trials, we also want to run trials that are individualized to specific patients, that is, drugs with a molecular determination before they, patients can enroll into the trial. So for instance, patients with IDH mutation would only go into trial with the IDH inhibitor or EGFR aberrations into trial with EGFR inhibitors. We also want to develop trials with molecular correlation so that we can learn from the drug trials to see if we can determine molecular signatures of response for the drug, figure out what are the mechanisms of resistance, or develop biomarkers to predict those treatment. We can also develop trials using imaging as a non-invasive biomarker. So I mentioned earlier about window of opportunity trials where patients would get a drug treatment and then undergo a surgery so that we can obtain the tissue and see if the drug changed that tissue as expected, maybe in comparison to the diagnostic tissue, or maybe comparison to a group that did not get drug before their surgery resection. Or we can give drugs and obtain molecular imaging before and after the drug to see if the drug has changed the metabolism of the tumor, for instance. So these are some examples of trials that require tumor tissue and surgery at the time of the surgery. We also are part of the NCI designated SPORE with three main projects where we are working closely with other SPORE centers throughout the country and collaborate with many other brain cancer centers throughout the country to develop these clinical trials also with GBM Agile. And our goal in the end is to learn as much about the patient as possible and their tumor type can help us come up with an individualized therapy for patients in the future. So really every patient is a part of the cure for us so that in the future we can develop better and better treatments do help us and help find the cure. This is a list of different clinical trials that are in development or currently available at UCLA. We also have many non-treatment trials at UCLA aiming at either looking for biomarker discoveries with imaging or trials that help us find uh, therapies to improve cognition and quality of life in patients with brain tumors. So thank you. And if you have any questions, please leave it in the chat and we will try to answer them during the Q&A session.